So let's start with the basics. What is the imposter syndrome? Well, it can be defined by many things, but essentially it's the feeling of being inadequate or a fraud and having a worry of eventually being found out. Essentially, what it is, is you feel like everybody else has a better idea of what they're doing than you do. And the way that this can manifest is, for example, by telling yourself, I'm not smart, I just work really hard. Or, I just got lucky. Or, I got in because they pity me, or I got that because they like me. So as a raise of hands, how many of you in the audience have ever felt like you were an imposter? either chronically or sporadically. Yeah, me too. <laughs> it's not, and I'm glad it's not just me. Um, and I see that the majority of you did raise your hands, and I think I speak for all of us that raised our hands in saying that if you did not raise your hands, we are extremely envious of you. So what's interesting about this term is that it was coined in 1978 by two researchers, Pauline Clance and Suzanne Imes. And originally, they described this phenomenon in women with high-achieving careers that were usually in male-dominated fields. Now, that's not the case today. This is a very common phenomenon that exists both in men and women. But what I want to talk about today is the fact that potentially the imposter syndrome isn't only due to some form of internal insecurity that we have, but potentially also due to external factors. So, a little bit more about me. So I graduated about six months ago, and I had a pretty ideal graduate experience. I got to go to international conferences, I got to run pretty much any experiment I ever wanted, and my supervisor was really supportive. However, I did struggle with a really strong sense of being an imposter throughout my degree. And it didn't matter which publications or awards or acknowledgments I got, I never felt like I belonged. And what this personal experience of mine I'm going to talk about demonstrates is potentially this wasn't just my own internal insecurity. So here I am, one day I'm in the lab, and I get a great idea. And I decide to run an experiment. As you can see, I'm super happy, I'm running my experiment, doing my thing. And I get some really interesting results. And I'm super excited about these results. I'm convinced that this could potentially advance patient care, that this would be really interesting for the scientific community, and I really want to publish these. So I go show these results to my supervisor. Unfortunately, I'm not met with the reaction I expected. I met with confusion and a general disinterest. So I'm a little bit disappointed. But I'm also extremely stubborn. So I start showing these results over and over and over again for the span of about a year. And every single time I show these results, I get the same response. First of all, he's forgotten about my results. And second of all, just not very interested. So I have been struggling with feeling like an imposter throughout my degree, but this is getting really bad at this point. I'm starting to question my place in academia, if even my scientific ideas are interesting for the scientific population. But there's a second part to this story. One day, my male coworker, who was a new student that had just started in the lab, he's a very smart student too, and he decides to run exactly the same experiment that I did, but in a slightly different system. So you see him, he's here, he's happy running his experiment. And he gets the exact same results that I did. But, and so he's really excited, and so he goes to see our supervisor to show him the results. And he gets a very different response from me. I want to point out again here that my supervisor has forgotten about my results that I've presented over the past year. And the response that my coworker gets is, wow, you're going to cure cancer. This is worthy of publishing. And amazing, let me show everyone. And he proceeds to run around the floor to show all the other professors about these amazing results. Now, two things are extremely clear about this illustration. 
Number one, I think we can all agree that art is my true calling. And number two is that it wasn't that my scientific ideas were flawed or not interesting for the general public. It's just that I wasn't the right vehicle for these ideas to be taken seriously. So at this point, I started thinking about, was this just my experience? Or was this very common for women in science? So I'm going to show you and talk about three different publications about how women's competency has been viewed in science over the years. And this is three of hundreds, if not thousands, of similar publications. And this also applies to any male-dominated field. This isn't just for academia. For example, in 1997, researchers published a paper in the journal Nature. And this is important for my next point. So what the journal Nature is, is a very prestigious scientific journal that authors want to publish in. It's very well recognized uh, by the scientific community. So these researchers published the results of the Swedish Medical Research Council about how they attribute their funding to applicants. And what they find is that for women to have an equal competency score to a man, she would have had to produce 2.5 times more science. If they've contributed the same amount, she would have consistently gotten a lower score in scientific competency. So that sounds outrageous, right? Just off the bat. But what does 2.5 times more science actually mean? Well, according to their metrics, it meant not one, not two, but three extra nature-level publications to be considered as competent as a man. So what's clear about this is that women aren't less competent than men in science. They were just being graded on a different scale. But this was over 20 years ago. What about more recently? Well, in 2015, there was a really interesting study that was conducted on an undergraduate class. This class was done remotely, so the students didn't have direct interactions with their instructors and only knew their instructors by first name. And the students were divided in multiple groups. One group of students was assigned to an instructor with a male name that was taught by a male instructor. One group was assigned to an instructor with a female name taught by a female instructor. And then the opposite was the case, where you had one group assigned to an instructor with a male name taught by the female instructor, and one group assigned to an instructor with a female name taught by the male instructor. And what they found is that it didn't matter what the gender of the instructor was. As long as the instructor had a female name, they would consistently get a lower score in teaching ability. So what's also interesting about this study is that this was done on a class of undergraduate students composed of men and women. So that means that this unconscious bias that we have isn't just related to men. It's also me and all of you. And this is something that we can't necessarily control. Next, in 2016, there was also another study done um, asking undergraduate students to rate their peers in academic performance. What was found is that ma male undergraduate students consistently overestimated the academic performance of their male peers and significantly underestimated the academic performance of their female peers compared to the actual academic performance. So again, this showed that there is no actual difference in competency, academic performance, teaching ability between men and women. It really is the perception of competency that is different. So why is this still the case? What is still holding us back from moving forward? Why do we still have these biases, unconscious biases, that exist against women in science? Well, there's many reasons and very complex reasons, but I'm going to focus on one particular aspect. And that's, for example, publications that come out like this one. And this was a publication that came out a year ago, exactly, in a journal called Nature Communications, which is also a pretty prestigious journal. And it was eventually retracted after causing lots of waves in the scientific community. And when, for those of you that aren't in science, when a journal is, or an article is retracted from a journal, it's usually because the authors have come to light to new information that makes their results either flawed or their interpretation flawed. What they were showing in this uh, paper is that if you were in the context of academia and you were a female mentor, 
you were hindering the future success of your female student. So again, demonstrating that women were less competent as mentors, teachers, and academics. But the main problem here is that they were interpreting correlation with causation and completely disregarded the societal aspects that could easily explain every single one of their results. So unfortunately, what this is doing is reinforcing this unconscious negative bias that exists against women in science. Even if we're reading this article and we know, for example, it's retracted, we still have read what they wrote and we still are reinforcing this negative bias. Now, the second part about this uh, paper that was problematic is the solution they were suggesting. What they were suggesting is if you are a male mentor, you should always be paired with a female student, and if you are a female student, you should always be paired with a male mentor, which should potentially um, allow female students to do better in science. Unfortunately, this is disregarding the historical nature of sexual harassment that has happened against women in science, specifically relating to academia. 52% of US academic medical faculty women reported experiencing sexual harassment in their careers. That's one in two women. So not only is this type of publication reinforcing this unconscious negative bias, it's also potentially putting women more at harm. Now here's a quote from Valerie Young, The Secret Thoughts of Successful Women, which is a book about the imposter syndrome that I highly recommend for any of you that is struggling with feeling like an imposter, regardless if you're a man or a woman. And what this quote says is, being female means you and your work automatically stand a greater chance of being ignored, discounted, trivialized, devalued, or otherwise taken less seriously than a man's. Now, that's a very powerful quote. And it should make you feel a range of emotions. You might feel mad, you might feel sad, you might feel defensive. And what I want you to do is to sit with that emotion and really try and understand where it's coming from. Take into consideration everything that I've talked about earlier and really try and see why you're feeling this way. Now, to go back to my personal experience, what ended up happening in that case is that I confronted my supervisor. I told him, look, I've presented these results for the past year and didn't get any response. And he was genuinely surprised. He had no idea. And I did end up getting the credit that I deserved. Unfortunately, that was a year later. That potentially delayed our publication. Now, what I want to suggest is if you are in charge of women in academia or in any male-dominated field, to encourage having these discussions, regardless if they're taboo or difficult to have. Encourage women to claim their credit, to interject when somebody interrupts them in a meeting. Because unfortunately, if we don't have these discussions and we continue ignoring, discounting, trivializing, devaluing 50 or so percent of the scientific population's ideas, we're not only holding back women in their careers and potentially their want to continue in academia, we're also holding back science as a whole. Thank you.